Thank you for joining this remote access program, which will focus on the implications and effects the coronavirus pandemic has and will have on the economy, both locally and globally. Access is the Young Professional Division of AJC, whose mission is to combat anti-Semitism, promote Israel's place in the world, and democratic values. Today's program will feature discussion with Professor Leo Leiderman, one of Israel's most senior economists, the Chief Economic Advisor at Bank Apoalim, Israel's largest bank, and a professor at Tel Aviv University's School of Economics. The coronavirus pandemic has created a new reality shifting the way we work and live today. The current crisis is impacting everyone from small and medium businesses to large corporations, all struggling to deal with our new reality of social distancing and uncertain economic times. But this crisis is different than our usual financial crises because for the first time in recent history, it is not solely financial, but driven by global healthcare pandemic. I'm a venture capitalist that invests in early stage tech companies, and I've seen firsthand the challenges the current economic state has posed on my companies. While some companies are experiencing growth during this period, others are more, challenges, are more challenged as their markets shifted, customers were forced to close shop, and the entire market is on edge. I'm extremely excited to learn from Professor Leo Leiderman about the economic realities and opportunities of COVID-19. But one last thing before we start, some housekeeping. If you have any questions or, reflecting, or reflections during our chat, please enter them into the Q&A box and we'll take about 20 minutes at the end of this call to engage in an open conversation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Leo Leiderman. Um, Professor Leo Lederman is the Chief Economic Advisor at Bank Apoalim, the largest commercial bank in Israel, and economics professor at Tel Aviv University. He is the former Managing Director and Head of, and head of Emerging Market Economics at Deutsche Bank, based in New York and London, and Senior Director and Head of the Research Department at the Bank of Israel. His previous positions include Advisor to the Governor and Monetary Department at the Bank of Israel and Chairman of the Economics Department at Tel Aviv University. Professor Leiderman completed his PhD at the University of Chicago under the supervision of Nobel Laureate Professor Robert E. Lucas Jr. and has consulted various banks and ministries of finance, including those of Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, Peru, Honduras, Czech Republic, and more, and served on the board of directors of several banks. Professor Leo, well, you like that I call you Leo, so I'll call you Leo from now on. Um, thanks so much for speaking, uh, for speaking to us today. Um, it would be great if you could start by giving us a brief overview of the effects of COVID-19 have had on the economy over the past couple of weeks. Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you all for participating in this uh, call. And uh, thanks very much to the organizers, to Tal, to Shai. Uh, I have seen the enthusiasm with which they have uh, prepared the, 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 this uh, event and uh, um, we, we very much appreciate, uh, again, your collaboration and, and, and participation in, in the event. Um, it is a Thursday evening in Israel, uh, 8.35, 8.37 p.m. I guess it is 1.37 New York time. Um, quite a strange time in Israel. We are after the Holocaust Memorial Day, preparing ourselves for the Memorial Day that comes before Independence Day. Uh, so in and by itself is uh, quite an unusual time um, that is supposed to be very happy. And um, the weather is very nice. And uh, we are all hoping that the whole, the so-called exit, exit measures and exit strategies for uh, uh, trying to relax some of the limitations of the lockdown that were imposed here, as in many other countries, uh, are going to be into effect. The truth is that um, we are already seeing more people in the streets, uh, more cars on the roads, and uh, the general uh, perception is that there is going to be a gradual process of exit, which is going to be very good for economics, for our social lives, for our uh, mental health, uh, for, uh, for everything, you know, the sort of some sense of uh, going back to, to, to some degree of, uh, of normal um, or to what's called the coronavirus, coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, new routine. Uh, 
Anyway, so I'd like to share with you very briefly uh, some of the thinking of not only myself, but the people I'm, I, which are my colleagues in the US and other places in Israel, of course, macroeconomists. I work on the area of macro. And uh, this is, of course, for those of you that are uh, managers of companies or uh, do you deal with strategy, uh, this is the area where we look at things from a top-down perspective. And uh, I want to believe that uh, almost any business strategy uh, starts with a top-down view of the world, uh, which is then uh, sort of complemented by the uh, bottom-up view. So um, I'll talk about the global war against COVID-19. If we are in a war, who is our leader? Um, we will speak about um, the issue of pandemic, lockdown, and uh, what I can call a sudden stop. I believe that, uh, I think this is the name that should be given to this. Uh, some people call this crisis the, the great lockdown. I think it is, in my, I like better a sudden stop. This is what I use with my students, by the way, online, of course. Uh, the impact on the economy, the policy response, financial markets, and then discuss exit strategy ahead and, uh, and opportunities. And of course, I'll try to be very telegraphic and uh, to leave enough room for, for discussion. So the world is at, the war, at war and the issues that are threatening us uh, as citizens of the world uh, are pretty much the same whether we are at this precise moment in Italy in the US, in Israel, in Turkey, or in South Korea. We are worried about our health. We are worrying about the infrastructure of our hospitals and medical system. We're worried about our families um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. We are worried about tomorrow. How will look the day after uh, Corona? And will there be something that we can call the end of this crisis? Because as you know, many people are thinking that, um, including in the medical profession, that uh, there, will no, there will not be such a thing as the end of the corona virus, that it will stay with us and we will have to find a way to sort of, uh, through vaccina vaccination or medication, to live with that the same way that we live with the flu and so on and so forth. So there is a global war and we don't know how the enemy looks like. There are many pictures of how the corona looks like, but uh, you know, we, we don't know who is that object that is putting a major threat in our lives. And, uh, and it's a global war. And in a global uh, situation like this of vulnerability, the first thing that you would ask for yourself is, maybe there should be a global reaction global leadership against the war, uh, um, to lead the world against this war. And I think that what I'm showing you here is sort of, in my modest view, one of the most frustrating aspects of the current crisis. The fact that there is no global leader. If for many years, the United States used to be the leader of democracy, freedom, and the, and the values, and so on and so forth, uh, right now, uh, of course, that is not the case. And uh, the strategy of the US is what mm, uh, President Donald Trump has said, America first. And the statement America first is a statement that he made before the corona. He made it right after he started his position at the White House. And he, and he was looking at the, um, the war issues, the commerce wars and trade uh, uh, war issues with China and other countries. America first. Um, of course, China is a country that uh, not all of us can fully understand. There is a, a lack of uh, full transparency there. And, uh, and in Europe, even in the Euro Eurozone, which are 18 countries like Germany, Austria, uh, the Netherlands, France, Spain, Portugal, even there, they haven't been able to coordinate among themselves a commonly uh, orchestrated uh, strategy to fight the virus. This is very frustrating because again, it is a, coronavirus is a global problem. 
And so when you, uh, when you do your lockdown and you look inward, the first thing you do is you close your economy. You close your borders. And this has been what has been happening right now. We saw yesterday the decision by Mr. Trump to limit uh, immigration to the United States and, uh, and so on and so forth. And you know, when you think of Churchill, Roosevelt, Martin Luther King, you think of uh, Mandela, all those leaders in crucial moments, they had uh, the ability to come to the audience of the population and give some wisdom, give some hope, give some sort of word of, uh, again, leadership. And, uh, and we are far away from that. And this is, again, something that, uh, at least for myself, is quite fr frustrating in this uh, episode. Okay, everything in economics in our, and in the analysis of this uh, crisis begins with the evolution of the pandemic. And I'm sorry to, I apologize for bringing these graphs here on the screen, in spite of the fact that you see them every day and every hour on TV, right? At least in Israel, I have some friends and colleagues that say, I don't want to watch TV anymore. I mean, these graphs are, uh, I had enough with them. But anyway, so what we're looking, this is from the Financial Times today. What we see here is the evolution of the pandemic. As you know, any, um, any sort of pandemic, any epidemic and pandemic, any virus has some sort of a pandemic curve where you see an increase in contagion over time. You reach a peak and then there is a decrease and eventually, um, hopefully, the virus disappears or the incidence is very small. So here you have the daily death, uh, the numbers of daily deaths uh, in different countries, okay? And we can see is that at the beginning, almost every country was on the upside. And in some countries you reached already the peak and, and you reached what I can call the most desirable part of the, of the pandemic curve, which is to be on the downward slope. And if you are on the downward slope, on the downward part, this enables the authorities to start conducting some sort of uh, um, exit strategies uh, to, to reopen the economy, to restart our social lives in a gradual way. What we can see is that uh, the first country that got into trouble, China, in the yellow or orange curve, you can see, uh, reached uh, the, the, the peak at about uh, 30 days after the, uh, this was discovered, probably the end of February. And since then, you see a decline. Of course, we have to be careful with the numbers from China because, uh, again, we, don't, we are not sure that uh, the statistics in China are truly objective, but let us consider this as, as the data. Then we can see Italy, one of the worst uh, affected places, where you can see also that it already did reach the peak and it's coming down. You can see uh, Austria, the same, South Korea, the same. The United States, it looks as if has reached or is reaching a peak and hopefully we will see a, a few days there and hopefully this will start to look better in the future. To me, these are all good news. These are good news. These are indicating that this pandemic is not behaving forever in an exponential way, okay? If we look at the, the following graph, you can see uh, different areas. In the New York State, um, of course, with the largest number of, uh, among different areas. And you can see that the, the good news are reflected in the sense that New York is already on the downward part of the, the pandemic curve. You can see the area of Italy, in Northern Italy called Lombardy, that was most severely affected uh, by, this, uh, by the virus. And also the same, Madrid, the same. Um, uh, uh, you can see that in Catalonia, Spain, the same, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't have very good news for those of you from New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey still moving on the upward direction. Uh, I guess the same um, uh, for some other uh, uh, states like Texas. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a matter of time. And of course, uh, I think uh, we are there. So I think that we are getting some uh, uh, sort of 
um, commonality of reaction and some uniformity of the evolution, the dynamics of this, that is saying that yes, there is a hope that maybe in a matter of weeks, we will be at a much lower number of victims of death in all countries. Now, having said that, we have to be careful because uh, the data indicate that even in countries like South Korea or Singapore or even Japan, that were already on the downward side, if you did a, a, a restart of the economy very, very, uh, in a very speedy way, not in a gradual way, and if you relax all the limitations uh, in a very abrupt way, uh, you may get a resurgence of the virus. And, uh, and that is, of course, something that is not very welcome, to say the least. Uh, the resurgence is not a full one. It's, it, it's not that you're going back to, to the, the peak in the previous, at the previous time. But again, we have to be cautious because many people in the medical uh, profession are saying that the coming winter, November, December, January of next year are going to be uh, uh, probably as serious, if not, if, if, if not more serious than what we are seeing now. But again, you know, we are in a situation that we have to live our lives in this very short run and any source of hope is something very important to, uh, to see here. Okay, the, in terms of the reaction of different countries uh, and different policymakers to the pandemic, I think, again, there has been a great degree of commonality um, between different countries, with the exception of the UK, with the sec uh, in, at the beginning, with the exception of Sweden and some other cases, the immediate policy response was closures, lockdown, okay? In other words, what characterizes this virus is a very high degree of contagion, much higher than in the case of a regular winter flu. And given the fact that the, the uh, space in hospitals and the number of ventilators is limited, uh, no one wanted to be in a situation in which uh, there is excess demand for a for hospital beds and the, and, and the hospitals being, uh, you know, rejecting uh, people because they have no room or no equipment. And so um, we got into this issue of the lockdown as if, uh, I think there has been no choice at, at, from that point of view, in my modest point of view, there are people that are suggesting that no, maybe the Swedish model has some things to, um, to, uh, to learn from because of this issue of uh, pandemic uh, um, uh, uh, contagion and so on, I will not get into that. But from an economic point of view, this is here we meet the sudden stop aspect of this crisis. Normally, when the world or the United States entered a recession, it was in a gradual way. Even in the Great Depression of 1929, it took two or three years before you saw a major rise in the rate of unemployment in the US. Yet here, the fact that the factories are closed from one day to the next one, theaters, movie centers, restaurants, all kinds of services, tourism, travel are all shut down. This has an immediate impact on the real economy. Believe me, we have never seen in the economic and financial history of the world a crisis like this one. And so this crisis begins with the real side of the economy. It's not like 2008 that was the subprime crisis where the problem was that there were some bubbles in the financial markets and then the mortgages and derivatives and so on. Here, it all started with something very real. And to your left, you can see the initial job claims in the United States. And the United States has had now five consecutive weeks of a tremendous increase in the number of job claims, including the data released today, 4.4 4 million, 4 .4 million new applications for, a, a, for, for unemployment compensation in the, in the past week. And we are now, uh, the U.S. accumulated in the last five weeks 26 million people, new unemployed people. I mean, this is a major shock. 
uh, again, think of the rate of unemployment in the US was 3% at the beginning of the year. Right now, it is 16%. And you know, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis um, indicated uh, that uh, their view is that uh, in the current quarter, the second quarter of the year, namely from April until the end of June, we're going to see the sharpest rise in unemployment. Because as you know, there is a delay in all these things. To your right, you can see uh, the rate of growth of retail sales. And of course, if shops are closed and service industry is closed and restaurants are closed and so on, um, true, there is still the internet, but we can see that in the last month, the, the volume of retail sales went down in the US by 8.7% in one month. There has never an, uh, been a month with such a decline in the whole history of the uh, data of the series for retail sales in the US. And again, I think we should all be prepared to week after week in the next uh, month and two months uh, of uh, very bad data, very, very weak data about uh, the US and other economies. And uh, to put it in a very simple word, um, the world is in a recession. It includes the US, Israel, everybody, because there is now a, a reduction in the level of real production rather than an increase of what we call growth. You know, when we are all surprised by this uh, object that came from nowhere called Corona, coronavirus or COVID-19, um, one of the important factors, and especially if we are talking about health concerns, is a major drop in confidence. We are less confident about our plans. Companies are much less confident about the, their, their business strategies. You know, um, I was discussing this in a conversation with Tal yesterday, that we meet all over the sectors in the economy, in every economy, more and more companies saying, well, question number one, how will the day after the corona look like? And as we said before, I'm not sure that we can define as exactly what do we mean by the day after corona, but I think when 80% of life goes back to normal. Second question, what should be my business strategy in the new world, okay? And there are some areas, tourism, will tourism be exactly the same? Leisure consumption spending, Maybe people will be more cautious about their travel, about their luxury, you know, hotels, uh, resorts, and, and so on and so forth. Um, not to mention the labor market, where many companies will want to really reassess whether they would like to rehire those people that were laid off or that were sent uh, on pay with leave or without leave. We had uh, last week, the International Monetary Fund provide us the latest forecast for economic growth. And of course, as you know, this is not a true science. Uh, you make some assumptions, there are some economic models, and you can come up with some um, uh, uh, forecasts. And of course, there is a lot of uncertainty around the forecast. To your left, you can see the forecast of world GDP, world real production. And you can see that the real production was growing at the rate of 2.9% in 2019. The IMF expects it to come down to minus 3% this year and to have a recovery of 5.8% next year. Okay, so recession this year. Now, these numbers, which in my view may be more on the positive side, um, uh, um, make a very important assumption that towards the second half of this year, um, life goes back to normal at least 75% uh, of capacity, let's say, poten of potential. Uh, to the extent that the pandemic uh, does not uh, enable the policymakers to restart the economy in a quicker way, and this uh, sort of gets on and gone to, to the second half of the year, maybe this 5.8% for next year will look much lower and maybe the minus 3% will look uh, uh, much weaker. 
You can see the United States minus 5.9% uh, this year, 4.7 next year, and we can see the Eurozone, the Euro area. As you know, the Euro area are 18 countries, uh, including Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, Spain, uh, Italy, and so on, France, and they have the same currency, the Euro. And uh, you can see that uh, Europe is the one that is uh, feeling the, the very strong impact of, of COVID-19. And uh, it, it, I mean, it's really an area uh, suffering and will suffer in the future, among other things, because of some structural problems there. In the following graph, what the, the economist that the IMF did is the following. The upper line is what was the trajectory of the level, not growth, the rate of growth, but the level of real GDP in an index, the level of real production in the world as of January 2020, okay? And this is the line, the line that you can see uh, uh, on the top of the graph. At the bottom of the graph, you can see the new forecast of April 2020. WEO means World Economic Outlook. That's the name of their publication. And, uh, and so this is the January forecast of the uh, World Economic Outlook and the I April forecast. And again, you can see that the whole thing is concentrated in 2020, 2021. Now, what you can see as the area painted in red is basically the cumulative loss of output during this period. The fact that the economies are not producing at full capacity nowadays means that compared to the potential, we are sort of uh, uh, not using all of our resources, okay? And so, um, so it's a loss of output compared to a baseline in which we didn't have the corona, but what can we say? And the number is exorbitant. It's, you know, $9 trillion. The, the, the whole red area amounts to $9 trillion. Of course, the way to avoid that or the way to, to sort of have a, a better ending would be that in 21, 22, we have such a steep rise in growth that you get a, a blue area above the graph that exactly offsets the red area under the graph. But we are not going to have this because the recovery from the corona, from the impact of the corona on the real economy is going to be very slow. It's going to be very slow because it affects the real economy. There are many uncertainties. There is the labor market. Uh, there are other uncertainties that we will discuss in a minute. And therefore, yes, uh, I'm sorry to say, but as of 2021, the world will be a poorer place than it was at the beginning of 2020, because basically we did not add enough goods, services, and so on to the economy. Next topic, what has been the policy response? Uh, and here uh, it is very interesting as a macroeconomist that there has been a consensus. And no matter which country you're looking at, um, almost in all countries, at the moment that the, the authorities saw that there is an emergency, they sort of uh, dealt with emergency measures. And so uh, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates, injected a lot of liquidity to the system. You can see here the, the balance sheet of the, of the Federal Reserve that uh, let's say in normal times should be about $3 trillion uh, uh, and now it's going to be beyond even $10 trillion. When the Fed buys assets and puts them in its balance sheet, it printed money. And so in the short term, this is very good because it is an injection of liquidity, which can maybe save the financial system in some of the companies that are suffering a lot from, from a cash flow constraint. But as a macroeconomist, we are always worried that in the medium and long term, perhaps this may be inflationary. This is not the case for the next year or two years because the world economy is much below full employment. And it's going to be very difficult to see a rise in inflation or a rise in wages that are inflationary if the economy is in, a, in the middle of a recession with very high unemployment. But 
uh, yes, we will have uh, future calls like this, maybe in a year or two, I guess, Tal and Shai, when we maybe discuss inflation and other risks that may come to the system. We see a sharp rise in government spending. In fact, in general, we should think at, about this crisis as a crisis in which the role of the state, the role of the government, will become much more dominant than it used to be in the last 10 or 20 years. Because who can provide the infrastructure in the medical area, hospitals, insurance, unemployment compensation to deal with this type of shocks? We are now facing a shock that, you know, maybe I don't, I hope it doesn't happen, but in one day, because of the issues related to global warming, we will see something similar happening, you know, with, with of course, uh, many, many differences. And, uh, and maybe this will not be the last virus for the next few years. We see governments increasing their budget deficits, okay? And what you can see uh, um, uh, in the upper part is uh, the increase in, in, in debt, and you can see in the lower part, the increase in deficits. Again, in normal times, macroeconomists like to think that these are very worrisome developments because you are seeing a government issuing debt, and the question is, is this sustainable? Maybe uh, the country is going toward a debt crisis. Again, it is not the time to worry about that because governments must act and must uh, deal with the programs to try to sort of uh, revive the economy and different sectors of the economy that are suffering from this. But in the future, governments will uh, sort of have to take some more disciplined measures. Maybe there will be a need to restructure their debts and so on and so forth. So lots of uncertainties about policies in the two or three years after this episode is finished. What has happened in the financial markets? Well, those of you uh, familiar with the financial markets probably know this graph. This is the uh, S&P 500 index for the past uh, 25 years. And you can see that there have been some cycles. The general sort of trend has been a positive trend, but we have seen number one is the NASDAQ uh, sort of crisis at the, at the end of 2000, 2001. There was the Enron episode. Uh, point number two is uh, the, the subprime crisis of 2008. In both these cases, the decline in the S&P from the best point to the lowest point was about 50%, 5-0. In the present episode, uh, when you compare the worst days uh, that were uh, sometime in March compared to the beginning of the year, uh, we saw a, a drop in the S&P by about uh, 26, 28. There were some days of minus 30%. But interestingly, in the last few days, in the last few weeks, because of the positive developments in terms of the pandemic curve, we have seen more optimism in the market. And uh, we can sort of say that uh, uh, right now, the uh, uh, S&P 500, is if you compare it to the beginning of the year, it's minus 12%. Minus 12% is like a, a typical correction. It, it, nobody would even uh, think of this as a crisis. The real winner, if we can call it this way, is NASDAQ and technology. Mm. I'm a great believer in technology sectors. NASDAQ, when I last saw it today, was minus 4% since the beginning of the year. So think of this. You have a friend or a colleague that, you know, disconnected himself or herself from the screen at, on January 1st, and now reconnected, reconnected, reconnected to the screen and the markets now, and you tell her or him, you know, NASDAQ is minus 4%. And you know what? Look at what's happening in the world. Look at unemployment, you know? And so uh, I think some people are, are looking at this with a lot of care because some people are thinking and some analysts that maybe markets have been too optimistic. 
Some analysts believe that we have not seen yet the bottom of the markets. There is a true debate about that. And I don't want to pretend to be the one that knows the real truth because no one knows uh, you know, uh, um, about the evolution of this. But yes, uh, the stronger the short-term recovery, the higher the risks that there will be some correction down the road because we know that the real numbers, uh, the, the, the numbers on the real side of the economy are going to be uh, not very nice to say the least. We can say that market volatility will remain high. Uh, what we have here is the VIX index, which is the sort of the, the fear index for the uh, you know, standard deviation, the options on the standard deviation of S&P 500 in the future. Anyway, this index of market volatility reached a number of 80, 80 in the context of the 08 crisis. In the present crisis, in the, the most dismal days, it was about 80 also, but right now it is about 40. And I can tell you one thing in talking and, and, and sort of lecturing before investors uh, in Israel and elsewhere. In this crisis, there has not been financial panic. No financial panic. So even if the markets went down at some point in February, March by, by 30%, in the US and other places. We have not seen most investors liquidating their positions, uh, their pension funds and so on. Of course, if there is someone with the uh, lack of liquidity, uh, this of course is, 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 has been done. Um, right now, there is a lot of money on the sidelines. Some people, many investors, most of them have sold part of their portfolios. Otherwise, we would not have seen a drop in the market indices. But, um, but having said that, I get to meet a lot of investors asking, what are the, where are the new opportunities? Okay? And I believe that uh, you know, any crisis creates new opportunities. I'm a strong believer that technology, that will have to adjust itself and adapt itself to the new realities, medical, biotech, medical technologies. I believe in China. I think that with all the limitations, we are going towards a, a new world economic and political order where China will be more dominant. And indeed the indices for the financial markets in China have dropped by a rate much lower than in the Western countries. Uh, Interestingly, so I said there has been not financial panics. There has not been currency panics. You know, currency markets, FX markets are the most liquid markets in the whole world. And, uh, and uh, you know, you can see here the US dollar, it's an index vis-a-vis -vis foreign currencies. True, there were some days of volatility between February and March, but uh, I think that is gone in the meantime. From the beginning of the year, the dollar has strengthened um, by about two, three percent. And um, I, I mean, we do not expect any major changes in currencies, even though, as we know, uh, um, if attempting to forecast the value of currencies is a very risky, uh, very risky operation or very risky uh, sort of a, a challenge uh, from that point of view. As you know, everybody is talking about exit scenarios or restart scenarios. And I think also here, there is a, some sort of a consensus among countries, you know. Where do you start? Shopping centers, schools, factories? And I think, uh, you know, the strategy is going to be folly, folly. First out, last in. So the first thing that went out to lockdown were schools, theaters, restaurants, travel, air travel, uh, of course, uh, tourism, and so on and so forth. In all of these, there is sort of a congestion of people. Classes at the university, we are all teaching now uh, online. And uh, I think these ones are going to be the last one. And uh, things will probably begin with industry, food, especially food production, the basic production, and then gradually move in Israel, there is, a, there is already a, some sort of restart of small shops, you know, a small laundry shop, a, 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 a small bakery, 
in the, with the provision that not more than four people are in the shop at one time, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, um, of course, if you have a clothing store, H&M in a large uh, shopping mall, uh, that's a problem because uh, who is going, are, are you going to be able to control their uh, entry of only four people? It's going to be very difficult. A lot of discussion here, but I think uh, it's about time that we do this because the economic, social, personal cost of the continued lockdown is tremendous. It's tremendous. And sooner or later, you have to take risks and uh, let us hope that vaccination and other things will come with time. Let me conclude now with the morning after a few comments. First of all, indicating that we truly don't know exactly how the morning after will look like. But my own inclination is on the following points. First of all, we are going towards a new world economic order uh, where there will be a deglobalization. What we have seen with the beginning, in the beginning, uh, with the trade war between China and the United States uh, before coronavirus, and with the Brexit decision by the UK to leave the uh, European Union, we are going to see now more and more countries putting first their own priorities and only later on global or regional uh, author, uh, uh, priorities. Having said this, in a country like Israel and even for the US, international trade is very important. It is a source of growth. And so the revival of the world economy and the trade relations is going to be very important. Second, I think the labor market will be at the center of major structural changes. People learned in companies the advantages of working part-time, of working online, of working from home, of maybe introducing a, a automation and robotization at a speed much larger, larger than we used to think. And uh, we believe that this is going to be uh, something that is going to take some time. Technology, new areas and opportunities, of course, the first place, the interaction between technology and medicine and hospi hospitals and viruses, you know, who is going to discover the chip that we can put in our mobile phone that will test for our um, tendency to be, uh, to be sick with, uh, with COVID-19 or any other virus, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think there is also a need to, to sort of organize better the management of governments of the whole crisis. And you can see it in the US, we see it also in Israel. Uh, there are some aspects where I'm going to be very delicate in my, in my formulation of this, that uh, they could be much better organized. You know, in Israel, there are days that we have the Ministry of Health saying one thing, and then the, the Prime Minister is saying another thing, and so on. So I think, um, uh, this is all new and countries are learning, you know, how to maybe better organize themselves for this. Consumer markets, we discussed before, if unemployment remains high for quite some time, as I believe it will, because of the restructuring of the labor market, um, you know, uh, will people go back to the same levels of consumption? Will people travel the same way they were traveling before? Wouldn't there be more, more a need for austerity, for saving more, for leaving some money, liquidity uh, on the side for a rainy day? Uh, we mentioned the risk of debt and inflation crisis. And let me conclude with a note of maybe mild optimism. Having said all this, uh, he, the history of the world and the universe shows us that all crises, all pandemics, all uh, sort of issues like this, all plagues uh, have a day in which they sort of evaporate or they end one way or the other. The world had a first world war, a second world war, a holocaust, many atrocities, uh, many killings, uh, including in the Middle East. But, uh, you know, I think as human beings, we have a nature of always 
thinking about a better future, worrying about ourselves, our families, and uh, and I think this is the key driver of um, of the of the world society. And so I uh, I hope that uh, that it will not take a long time, and we will be looking at this as sort of a temporary episode with major impacts on our lives but that can be removed aside and maybe put in our agenda some new uh, thinking and new plans whether it is for our private lives or our businesses so tal let me stop here and uh, take some questions perfect thank you so much uh, leo that was a really comprehensive uh, overview and i have to say that i you know as a venture capitalist this uh, it's my job to to share your your optimism, and uh, you know I've seen firsthand the effects and challenges the current economic price, that current economic state has posed on on my companies. And we really did spend a lot of time working with our founders on crisis management and and financial planning. Um, and I'm interested in in kind of your to hear kind of your thoughts on the sectors you think will thrive during this area and. Which sectors do you think will be will be hurt the most and should plan for longer term recovery? Um, but more importantly, how should business strategies be changed in view of the current crisis? Again, I, I think that the the, uh, the the issue of sectors uh, has to do a lot with um, with the future because when when investors like yours are looking at their investments. Uh, you know, they are looking beyond 2020. They are looking at uh, from now until 2025 or maybe 2030, uh, 10 years from now. And, um, and there are a lot of uncertainties. Again, I think one thing that the crisis uh, sort of uh, uh, tells us is some sort of the need to go back to basics. You know, go back to basics. What are the basics? Our health, our food, our uh, self-confidence, our security. Um, I think that uh, these things are extremely, extremely important from, the, from that point of view. And so I think uh, the example, again, of technology, the interaction with the new areas of online, online working, relatively, you know, more frequently used, online lecturing at the university, at secondary school, at elementary school, at kindergarten, who knows? Um, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, these are uh, sort of some of the most important areas. We see a lot of interest now in home entertainment. Maybe, uh, Tal, it will take a lot of time to see people in a full theater, like the Lincoln Center, or, uh, you know, or, uh, listening to a concert or to go to a movie theater and so on. And we see the behavior of Netflix and uh, Amazon and others and the whole entertainment uh, industry. Um, I, I, I think that um, we are at a time, of course, that there is more and more consciousness at the issue of global warming. So technologies that they, and the, any things that are related to combating that uh, alternative sources of energy, whether it is solar energy, wind energy, okay? But the world was already on a trend for that. Being more green, uh, uh, I think these are uh, quite important aspects. Uh, old sources of energy, like, uh, you know, oil uh, and, and carbon, uh, of course, are going to be on a decline, I guess, uh, from this perspective. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, Maybe your your uh, your managers and your investors have a lot of imagination in this sense, but again, I would go thinking about this: what are going to be the basic needs, the strong needs of the of the world? And again, I, I believe one need is going to be to produce all kind of technologies, all kind of applications, all kind of programs that help governments to orchestrate a crisis like this one. And they don't have this. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, we have uh, just about under 10 minutes left and a few questions coming in from the, for the Q&A. Um, so we have a question from uh, Jeffrey Rucker. Um, what do you think individual lifestyles and careers will look like in the new normal, short term and long term? In South Korea? In the US. 
what do you think individual lifestyles and careers will look like in the new normal, short term and long term? Yeah, again, I think we will all be very cautious, very, very cautious. Um, there will be more distancing. I'm sure you have seen the, the pictures in, uh, in the various websites about how the airplanes are going to look like, more distance in, in between one passenger and the next. But this means that the price of an air ticket is going to go up, okay? Because the costs uh, are probably the same. I hope that oil uh, uh, st stays low and so the price of uh, air tickets will be there. But I think, um, yes, uh, less contact, you know? Every time I was in Asia, I, 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 I was surprised to see, you know, in Israel, we're very used to, and, uh, to, to some sort of physical contact, to shaking hands and to hugs and, and so on and so on with friends and colleagues. And uh, uh, I don't know, hard to think of this that, that will disappear, but uh, I think uh, we will have more modest lives and more inward looking, more home uh, family uh, uh, time. Uh, I think. Mm -hmm. And we have, uh, we have a few questions coming in on kind of the ramifications of the crisis for Israel's economy um, and uh, whether you see the relations with China changing um, and, with, and how long do you think it will take until Israeli unemployment gets back to the levels we saw earlier this year? Yes, well, uh, starting with the last question, I think uh, we will not see the unemployment rate go back to that number even until the end of 2021. Uh, you know, the, the, the labor market is a market that is very slow to move. And uh, here there was something very rapid because of the lockdown, the sudden stop. And therefore, unemployment shoot up. Uh, but, uh, uh, but now, in terms of the recovery for people to go back again, companies are going to be very cautious, are going to be very, very sort of uh, uh, picky about maybe this is the time to improve efficiency and productivity. Maybe instead of having 20 people do their jobs, I can have 10 people and the rest will work or from home in a, on a part-time basis and so on and so forth. For the Israeli economy, I think we are pretty much like uh, some countries, uh, some other countries in the world. Israel is a very open economy. And uh, Israel depends a lot of, on, on trade and on capital inflows and on tourism. Last year, we had a, an, a record inflow of tourists, more than 4 million tourists uh, coming to Israel. And of course, right now, we don't have that. Um, Israel is very similar to the US in the sense that about two thirds of the economy is consumption, private consumption, our consumption as families, as households. And now again, if we see that the recovery of the economy and recovery of unemployment is going to be slow, people are going to be very careful in their consumption plans. And this in and by itself will lead to slower growth in the economy. So I think that in general, we are going to see much more awareness about the importance of saving, of putting some money on the sidelines for the rainy day and, uh, you know, especially the young generations uh, got very used to this uh, low cost travel. And some of my students are uh, telling me, uh, you know, next week I'm going to Rome and uh, four weeks after that I'm going to London. And they, here I'm paying uh, $150 for my ticket and here $200 for my ticket. So the temptation for all of that has been a tremendous one. But this meant at the end of the day that the rate of saving has been coming down. And I think uh, we will all be much more uh, sort of cautious about that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, so we have uh, time for, for one last question. Um, as each and every one of us is affected by the current crisis and you're someone who, who's lived and worked through, through previous ones, what's your advice to the young professionals listening to us today? Well, uh, my, my best advice is, uh, is to think that life goes on, okay? Life goes on. Crisis and the uh, fluctuations are part of our lives. And uh, again, I'm a great believer in the 
what I sort of defined previously as the natural desire of all human beings to have better lives for themselves and for their families. And, uh, and uh, together with this, to remember something that, again, those of you working in finance know very well, crises create opportunities, create new opportunities. And as I indicated before, a lot of people um, that I know uh, did not react in a way of panic. And in this crisis, many, many people, I think, you know, policy, maker, policy making had a very important role because the fact that the typical individual or business sector saw that the Fed moved immediately to provide liquidity and to lower interest rates, and the same about governments. Uh, I think this was sort of a, a tranquilizing factor, which is very important. It's very important. And so I think that uh, we saw many people uh, just rushing to, to look for opportunities, you know, because uh, uh, as uh, George Soros once said, the best way to succeed in the market is to buy low and to sell high. Okay. And so, uh, so you know, and I, I, as, as you can recognize from my accent, I was born in Argentina. And one of the things that George Soros did in Argentina many times, as you know, Argentina has a crisis almost every half year and every change of government uh, and, and a change of government every year. And Soros had a lot of vision in, uh, at the times that everybody was selling assets, hotels, ski resorts, great touristic places in Argentina, shopping centers in Buenos Aires. He came with liquidity and he bought those because he said, there is going to be a day after the crisis and I do have the liquidity. So I think, of course, he lost some money in other opportunities. So there are risks. But again, to think that life goes on and to look for the new opportunities, that's my best advice. Not to react in a panicky way. Uh, I think that uh, these are my main lessons and I hope they are still valid towards the future. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for that. We had another question um, from Nancy Price as to, you know, if this is the worst uh, crisis that we've had in recent history, then why is the stock market still fairly high? And I think you just you just answered that by by saying that people haven't haven't panicked I mean, yet. And, uh, I think I think um, we don't know yet if this is the worst uh, crisis in history. I think the worst crisis was uh, 1929, because in 1929, very briefly the government did not provide the support to the economy to revive the economy. And the thing that you saw was banking panics, panics. People panicking to withdraw their deposits at banks. We know all these pictures from the history books. You know, imagine you have your savings, you know, you are already retired or not, and you see that the world is in a very difficult situation, you want to withdraw the money and the bank is on a bank holiday you're not able to reach your own saving. That's, you know, that's hard to imagine this thing. Here, we are in better hands, okay? And, uh, but on the other hand, Tal, I think, as I said before, markets have a tendency, and there is a lot of research in finance about this. Markets have a tendency to do overshooting and undershooting. Markets have a tendency when the good, the, there are good news, to increase by much more than fundamentals uh, are implying. Markets have a tendency to go down by too much when the news are bad. And uh, I have the feeling that maybe we have not seen yet the lows, the market lows uh, this year. But again, um, you see different people with different opinions. And I have a lot of sort of uh, uh, uncertainty attached to this forecast that maybe we have not seen yet the, the bottom of the market. Thank you so much, Professor, um, Thank you. for your incredible insight. I really enjoyed the conversation and I'm sure it was extremely valuable to, to all of our listeners. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ali Turkle. I'm the Associate Director for Access Global. And I also wanted to um, thank Professor Liederman for joining us and Tal Tokner for moderating this really interesting conversation. Um, these are very uncertain times, but it's, it's reassuring to have some facts and figures and to discuss the history and, and kind of the, the possible future 
um, after this crisis. So thank you both for, for joining us. And I also wanna give a special shout out to Shai Zabdi, our Access Israel manager for putting this conversation together. Um, and I wanted to let everyone know about our upcoming programs. We're going to be having um, a conversation about um, Israel. If you have any questions that you've ever wanted to ask, um, we are gonna have a program called um, Access Israel Unfiltered. So please join us for that. On May 6th, we're gonna be having a conversation about sports diplomacy. And on May 14th, um, a conversation with a really interesting entrepreneur in our culinary diplomacy series called Borderless Wine, who creates wine in conflict regions with um, all kinds of diverse folks. So really interesting lineup coming your way. You'll be getting more information in a follow-up email from us. And I wanna thank everyone for their time. We hope you're all doing well and staying safe. And um, we really appreciate you spending time with our um, Access Young Professionals and wishing you a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Leo. Thank you.